Yeah, you guys, I've talked about Andrew before. He's well known for his work internationally and he established the Foundation for Relief and Reconciliation. And he's most commonly known as the Vicar of Baghdad, which <laughs> is, um, uh, he did such incredible work there and has, continues to do such incredible work throughout the world, just in reconciliation and in facilitating rescue for people and quite amazing. So Andrew, we decided that um, we wouldn't ask you questions because we know you weren't a huge fan of being interviewed or so we've heard. So I just give you the floor and however the Holy Spirit leads you, this is good. We'll just mute and yeah, that would be wonderful to hear from you. I'm so blessed. Can you place up online scriptures from the Bible? Can you place up online certain verses from the Bible? Yes. So which uh, verse? I want to look at Romans chapter 8. Don, I assume you're doing that, correct? Uh, so I was checking the um, sharing options. I thought you were doing it. I will do it. I can, I can do it right now. Screen share. Can you guys see? Uh, yeah, it's coming up. Okay. So. Uh, and I want to look at the verse which says. Do you um, prefer a version? No, I don't mind. Okay. Oh, King James. I oh, use yeah. either the NIV or the King James. Okay. I'm a bit old fashioned, but I usually use the Greek or the Hebrew. You could read to us in Greek or Hebrew. We wouldn't understand what you were saying, but we'd love uh, I might get one or two words of the Hebrew, but not much more than that. You'd be doing better than me, for but sure. This isn't Hebrew. So, this is Ro Romans is Greek. Romans. And what was the passage you wanted? Chapter 8. OK. Just and the whole chapter? I think it's. Verse 24, I think. The verse which says the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with what is to come. Okay. Marcia, try putting a colon between the chapter and verse numbers. Or okay. click straight on the chapter there. That is probably even faster. Okay. So how's that? Can you see that? Yes, I can. Did you want us to read it? I can't what? move it up. Can you move it down? To 24. Uh, there we are. Which verse is it? There. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. It starts with, for we know that the sufferings of this present world are not okay. worthy to be compared with the glory that is to come. Okay, so I'll just do a search of that. See if this works. Do you think this will work? Maybe over here, a search over here. Or the sufferings of this verse family. 18 i think verse yes 18. it is verse 18 back up let's see if that'll work okay verse 18 for i reckon that the okay perfect there it is it's very oh. good so i reckon that the sufferings of this present time 
Christ. Are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to come. And it shall be revealed in us. Mm. So that's fine. You can take it down now. I will just um, begin by praying a short prayer in Aramaic, just a blessing in Aramaic, because that was Jesus's language, though he doesn't say the blessing in scripture, but it is here. Right, let us thank you, Lord, for this wonderful passage that the sufferings of this present world are not to be compared with the glory that is to come. Shimid Baba, Rona, Broka, Kusha, Ha Allaha, Allahuma Anna. Amen. Which is basically the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. But we always have added to that one God. Because Muslims think we've got three gods. So we always place in one God. And then we say, uh, Messiah come, the glory come amongst us. So it's rather good, actually, because the, our use of the blessing talks so much of the glory as well. And I think I can probably say that my congregation in Baghdad, I'm not there anymore, but I still um, minister to them. My Sunday sermon is always um, used amongst my Iraqi people, but lots of them are in Australia and Canada nowadays. Um, I've only got about... 30 people left in Baghdad. I have had, I started the church in 203, started being the vicar of the church in 203. And since then, we've had the most incredible time. Incredible time of ministry. I used to well, I still say, I have never seen glory and miracles and the miraculous power of God like I saw in Baghdad. And I can remember I had lots of Iraqi children that I adopted into my clan, we used to have a clan, and the clan stands for those who are called, loved, and named. And I remember when we had some people over with us from Voice of the Martyrs one day, and one of them spoke to one of my young people who was like my adopted daughter and we had been meeting just as a staff meeting she was on my staff and whilst these voice of the martyrs people were over there were rockets coming in and there were bombs going off and 
it was all so terrible. And the man from Voice of the Martyrs, who actually came from Canada, actually said to Mylena, he said, I've been all around the world. I've never been to a place where there is as much suffering as here. But he said, you are the happiest group of people I have ever seen. And Lena, who was just 17 at the time, she turned around to him and she said, you see, when you have had everything taken from you, all you've got left is Jesus. And I hold to those words even throughout my life now. Because the one thing that we knew for certain was that we had the power of our Lord Jesus amongst us. And one of the things we have always done is do an incredible work of providing relief, health care, education. We had in every church I've ever worked in in the Middle East, whether it be in Jordan or in Iraq, we've always had a full medical clinic, seeing over 100 patients every day. We provide comprehensive dental treatment as well. So we have a very holy dental service. And we also have a very big spiritual healing service. All the time, people come to us and ask us to pray for healing. And all the time, we see healing. The most amazing story was a young lady with cystic fibrosis. And her father came to our clinic and the clinic was in the original church hall. So it was on the campus of the church, the very place where I lived. And slept and dreamt and did everything else. And one man came around once. He wasn't a Christian, he was a Muslim. Most of our patients were Muslims because most of the people were Muslims. So he came to me and he said, Abuna, Abuna, Abuna is what they call me, which is like daddy. Abuna, Abuna, my daughter is so dear, ill. She is so ill, she's got cystic fibrosis and she's dying. I want to bring her here for treatment. I said, this is just a little GP surgery. You can't take her out of the top hospital in Iraq and just bring her to us. What I will do with you now is we will pray for her and then you go to her and I want you to take this anointed cloth. So I anointed a cloth and I said, you take this to her. And Yeshua, Jesus, will heal her. Not maybe, definitely. So he went to the hospital and he got to the hospital. And as he arrived, he could see all the 
doctors racing around his daughter. And the doctor came out and said, I'm very sorry for him. As you were away, your daughter died. And Ibrahim said, but Abuna said that she would be healed. And then he said, Abuna said, touch her with this cloth and say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. In Aramaic, we don't say Yeshua like in Hebrew. We say Yeshua. So he went in crying and he was crying and crying. And he went in and touched her with the anointing cloth and said, In the name of Yeshua, Yeshua, you are healed. And you know what happened? She sat up from her deathbed and she said, Daddy, I'm hungry. Can you get me some food? <laughs> so I said, don't worry, we've had this happen before. Just like Jairus' daughter. And that was just, that was not the only resurrection story that we had. I used to, one of the things which has very much influenced me is that my grandfather was the assistant to the great revivalist preacher Smith Wigglesworth. And I like it because I've seen more resurrections than Smith Wigglesworth. And if you can beat Smith Wigglesworth at one thing, that's the kind of thing you want to beat him at. And even to this day, Smith Wigglesworth's, I have his Bible, his actual Bible, which is full of the most incredible notes and his sermon notes, his anointing oil bottle, all of these products are mine. And I can remember the day when Smith Wigglesworth's great grandson is a very good friend of mine. He's a very good oral surgeon or facial maxillary surgeon. And his mother, who was Smith Wigglesworth's granddaughter, I took her funeral. And um, we didn't see her resurrect, but there again, she was 106. So mm -hmm. she'd had a good life and a good death. And before she died, I used to go and see her in the nursing home and we would pray together. And my Bible from her grandfather, she said that this Bible she had, when it was first used by him, he bought it. And they were on a long train journey together. Her job was to go through every pipe, every page, make sure it wasn't stuck. And at her funeral, the Bible was placed on top of her coffin. And it's quite funny because Smith Wheelsworth was not an intellectual man. He was a plumber. My grandfather was not an intellectual man. He was a plumber as well. And the reason that my grandfather got the job was not because he was a great preacher, but his teacher, the Assemblies of God Bible College, 
just so happened to be a plumber as well, called Smith Wigglesworth. And it's funny that both Smith Wigglesworth's grandson and me, who are both very good friends of each other, we don't know anything about plumbing, but we both became doctors. So he became a Max Fax doctor, and I became an anaesthetist. So we have lots of medical things in common. And Henry Fardell, his great great grandson, says that Smith Wigglesworth always said that as a covenant people, our glory of the glory of God will always be seen unto the third generation. And the glory of God has really been seen unto the third generation, whether it be in facial maxillary surgery or even in anesthetics. The good thing was that my last job in anesthetics was running the cardiac arrest team at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. So I was into not putting people out, but raising them from the dead. So in a way, I saw even more resurrections. But they didn't all make it for very long. You know what it's like when somebody has a cardiac arrest. You fight very hard to get them breathing and living again, send them to intensive care. And then intensive care, they usually, well, there's 50% chance of them dying. Um, I'm very pro intensive care because I worked there for many years. But um, these are just stories of how the glory, the suffering, the terrible suffering in my time in Iraq, as Christians, we had over a thousand of our community killed. And I also looked after the Jewish community as well. Iraq used to have, before the establishment of the State of Israel, Iraq used to have the biggest Jewish community in the whole of the Middle East. It was bigger than Morocco, Israel, Palestine, and it used to have half a million Iraqi Jews in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And nowadays we have four Jews left in Iraq. And they can never declare to anybody that they are Jewish. But we used to always have the feasts together, we'd meet together for Pesach and Sukkot and Shavuot. And the Jews used to come into the church and do their Jewish prayers as well. I used to allow them to do that. And um, we love them. We really love them. And the amazing thing was that uh, of our Jews, two of them were very good surgeons. One of them was a Max Fax, facial surgeon and dentist and worked in our clinic. And the other one was an, a very good orthopod. Mm. Brother and sister they were. And um, 
Henry Fardell, who's the great grandson of Smith Wigglesworth. He and our Max Fax Jewish doctor became great friends over the internet like this. They used to talk to each other all the time. And um, it was really good to see how once again these links, even in the Jewish sphere, could become a real source of the glory of God. And so it was all quite bloody work, but it was liberating work, and it was glory work. And this work is still continuing to this day. And we had one of the institutions in um, Baghdad was started by Mother Teresa. And this institution was a home for children who were just found in boxes on the streets. People would often, particularly if a child was born without limbs, and whether it was a response to depleted uranium, that's what lots of people say, but we had a huge number of terrible congenital malformations. So children being born with severely abnormal limbs or with no limbs at all. And um, the Mother Teresa sisters never allowed you to take pictures of the children. But they were incredible. They couldn't walk, but they could all talk. And all of them spoke not in Aramaic or Arabic. They all spoke in English with an Indian accent because they were all from the Mother Teresa sisters. So we had these very, very good, lively children. And I will never forget two wonderful boys, Emmanuel and Isaac. And they were taken by an Australian lady. And they didn't have limbs properly to walk. And she took them to Australia and they had lots of surgery. And these boys have done so well. I would love to go and see them. But I don't know where they are. But one of them was on Australia's Got Tal Talent as a singer. And the other one swam in the Paralympics for Australia. So it's incredible to see that these two little children, rescued by the Sisters of Mercy from Mother Teresa, how they have shown the glory of God around the world because they are so full, even to this day, of the love of God. Have any of you ever seen their stories on television? Yes. Well, they have had some wonderful stories, particularly from the Australia's Got Talent, and also from... Um, a documentary that was made about them. So what we have seen incredibly 
is how the suffering of all of our pain in Iraq, the terrible suffering, I could, I've written books about it all, and I'm just writing another book now, which will be my 28th book. And it always makes me laugh when I think that I've written 28 books. Because when I left medicine and went to Cambridge University to the Vicar Factory, I can remember one of my tutors saying to me, your writing is absolutely terrible. You will never be able to write in response to one of my essays. And now I've written more books than this professor has. So maybe a bit of the glory from Wigglesworth is coming down on me as well. So can you ask me questions now? Sure, if you don't mind. If you don't mind us asking a few questions, um, I'd love you to. Um, I know that you were um, you were ordered out of your parish, um, and I was just wondering. I think that was Saint George's Church in 2014 or something. They commanded that you leave. 2014, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. You know, he used to be my assistant. And he came to Iraq with me, and he was my assistant. And when I left, the, I was director of the International Center for Reconciliation at Coventry Cathedral. And I left that, and he became the Bishop of Durham, and then the Archbishop of Canterbury. So I still think I got the better job going to Baghdad, though. <laughs> but and when I was made to leave in 2014, it was one of the worst days of my life. I'd always said to my people, I will not leave you, don't you leave me. But when I moved out of um, Iraq, we moved to Jordan and we set up a very, very fine clinic and a school. And we have had literally about 3,000 Iraqi refugee children go through that school. At the moment, we've got 2,000 left, but they are going all the time. And they're going to Australia and Canada. But that is also part of the glory that is to come. I've got from all my adopted children, I have now got six of them who are at medical school training to be doctors in Australia and Canada. Wonderful. We need, we need doctors. <laughs> um, I was also um, wondering about, I guess you were kidnapped at one point and then there was like a miraculous provision of money. I thought I heard a story about that. No, I was, I was thrown into a dungeon and it was completely black. It was whilst I, I used to do a lot of negotiation for getting hostages back. And I was thrown into this black, dark dungeon 
where you couldn't see anything at all. And it was only one day I remembered that I had my satellite phone. It didn't work in the dungeon, but it had some light on it. Mm. And I got the light from my phone and I looked around the floor to see what kind of place I was in. And I was in a dungeon which was covered with parts of human bodies, hands, feet, toes, and legs. Oh my God. And I had just come to America from a meeting with Mahesh Shavda, who's a great glory miracle man in North Carolina in Charlotte. And when I left, he gave me a huge body belt and filled it up with money. I had over $50,000 in cash. And when the kidnappers took me, they didn't take the belt off me. And they didn't take the phone off me. So eventually, I was able to give them $50,000 and get out. So that was another part of the glory. Where was that in Baghdad or something? Or was that in? Sorry? Where was that in Baghdad, he asked? Oh, uh, well, when the th problem was that when you were looking for hostages, you didn't know where you were exactly. It was in near Baghdad. I'd woken up in Baghdad, but driven quite a long way. It was um, towards Babylon. So did you find it difficult? Um, being the vicar of Baghdad, of course, you're, you have your, um, you're kind of alone in the faith like we're we're blessed in this nation in that you know we we think we're persecuted if someone says a bad word to us but you truly saw persecution and um i just curious about that aspect of things like did i i'd assume that the glory would go before you and prepare but i was just kind of curious your insight to just that type of boots on the ground ministry and now I sound like I'm interviewing you. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. Because it can be very lonely when God sends you into the middle of a war zone like that. And I can remember being at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad one day. We, The Americans built... Um, an incredible embassy called the NEC, the new embassy compound. And apart from looking after my Iraqi church, I was the chaplain at the NEC. So we used to, I had a very good congregation. I had a wonderful, I had two generals in my church. I had General Roddy Porter, who was the top British general, and I had General David Petraeus, who was the top American general. And I can remember how the Roddy Porter, the English one, was actually our chief wor worship leader on the guitar in a very informal, charismatic service. But Hi. I remember one night and... Oh, sorry, I'm on a Zoom meeting. And I, we were having the rockets sent into the compound because people used to try and 
target us. They knew where we were, so they would send mortar bombs and rockets in. And when the air sirens went off, everybody used to have to get flat down on the floor. And I couldn't do it because of my MS. So I couldn't get down on the floor. But to be quite honest, if they're going to blow you up, they'll blow you up anyway. So on one occasion, we were there and we'd had all this rocket attack. And the chap on the, the everybody was on the floor, but the guy playing the piano managed to reach his hands up from the floor to the piano to actually continue the worship. And they started singing a song which I had never known before. And it was no, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone. And that um, song was absolutely incredible. And I've written about it before in my some of my books. So it's amazing that you mentioned that never being alone. Wow. Did oh that's that's just like we can't even we can't even imagine that type of uh, um, persecution, that type of an attack. And reaching up and playing worshiping in the midst of that is just <laughs> Like like the girl that you were talking about who um, who said when you've lost everything all you have is Jesus and exactly. that was so good and I'm gonna Google no never alone now and listen yeah, to yeah find no never alone do you have time for one more question from someone else other than me or are you tired now would you like to no I'm I'm just waking up are you. <laughs> You were saying that in your church you see angels, and that's one of the biggest group of angels you've ever seen is in your church and at the gravesite of you were you were mentioning that uh, the, the the gravesite it was a prophet. Who was that prophet again? Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Wow. And you were saying so Ezekiel's tomb. I can remember um, one day. I was, it was just in the war in 203. So when everybody was coming in, it was actually the same day they pulled down the famous statue of Saddam Hussein. And um, I looked in the clouds and I saw what was like, I saw it as a huge glory cloud over the Tigris and the I, I said to God, what is this? This is incredible. And he said, read the book of Ezekiel. I didn't know it had 48 chapters. So it took a long time to read. And after reading that, I saw how Ezekiel had fallen down on his knees by the Kabar River. And the Kabar River was a river that ran in between the Euphrates and the Tigris. And so I started asking all of my team where Ezekiel's shrine was, where was his tomb? And eventually, well, it was quite difficult because I asked all these people, Christian leaders, including the guy who had been Saddam Hussein's 
air flight marshal, George S. Sada. And George S. wrote a very good book about how um, Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction did exist, but he had taken them all out to Syria. So they were there anyway. I didn't know, I couldn't find where Ezekiel was. So in the end, I looked it up on Google. And I said, where is Ezekiel buried? And it was in a place called El Kifl, which means of Ezekiel. And El Kifl, E-L-K-I-F-L. I went down to El Kifl and stupidly I went on a Friday, which is the big Muslim prayer day. And it was in Babylon, just outside Babylon. And I asked people when we got there, where is uh, El Kifl, where is this equals tomb? And I got caught in the biggest donkey traffic jam of my life. <laughs> they were all donkeys. <laughs> donkeys, donkeys, donkeys. And so we were completely stuck. Anyway, we got there eventually. And when we got there, we found a beautiful ancient oriental synagogue and in this synagogue was the huge tomb of Ezekiel and it was greatly revered by everybody even the Shia Muslims looked after that synagogue and Ezekiel 43 was written around the ceiling in Hebrew. Unfortunately, I could understand it. And as we got there, it then became, I'm not into going to shrines and things of, but I've never been to a shrine of a real prophet before. And when we went there, it was as if we were walking in to the visions of Ezekiel. We could see spinning wheels, and there were angels, and it was the most incredible place. So I didn't just go there once. I made this a regular pilgrimage that I would always go to. And I used to take my visitors there. So people who came to see me from around the world used to come there with me. And they all saw the angels and the spinning wheels and the glory. I mean, this was walking into a glory zone like no other glory zone. We were muted. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, he just said we're gonna save our money. We want to go there for sure. Oh, no, well, you gotta take us there. Right <laughs> you're, you're gonna be our interpreter. <laughs> Interpreting the glory zone. Yes. Yeah. Well, I would love to go back there. It's not easy. It was quite strange because. I spent 19 years in Iraq altogether. It wasn't just from the war time, because I started going there many years before the war. Mm. So in all the years that we, as in the international community, including you, 
were bombing Iraq and we were dropping toxic weapons. And um, in all those years I was there, it's quite funny that I have um, spent a lot of time with dodgy world leaders. You know, Tariq Aziz was Saddam Hussein's deputy. And before the war, before Saddam was toppled, I would go and see him regularly in his palace. And then they caught him. So for years, I went to see him in prison. So I used to regularly go and see Tarek Aziz. But Tarek Aziz, he may have been culturally a Christian by background, but he never responded to the words of Jesus. He would never even let me pray for him. I used to ask him regularly, can I pray for you? No, he didn't want to be prayed for. And you know, when I next had dealings with him was when they stole his body when he died. And his body was stolen from Bayat, the Baghdad International Airport. And um, all the Mokhabara in Iraq, the Secret Service, contacted me and they said, Abuna Andrew, Abuna Andrew, we cannot find Tarek Aziz's body. Can you find it for us? So there I was actually sitting in America at Wheaton College where I was teaching. And they expect me to find Tarek Aziz's body. And I did. Wow. With my friend, help of my friends. And it was in the duty free. <laughs> It Sorry. was in the duty free in the airport on one of the shelves at the back they had put his body. Oh my God. And his family was so grateful that I, this remote cleric, had managed to find their dad's body. And so I did his funeral. I've done funerals of quite a lot of tyrants. I did Yasser Arafat's funeral. Yes. And he was a Muslim. I love the story about your, your son, how your son uh, invited him to the birthday yeah. party. That's awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was so funny. Yes, Arafat. My son. I said he was about to be fired. I said, Jacob, who do you want to come to your birthday party? And he said, I want one of your friends. Which one? Yes, sir. Arafat. I said, it's not yes, sir, Arafat. It's yes, sir, Arafat. And so next time I was with him at least once a month, sometimes more, and I said to yes, Arafat, my little boy Jacob wants to invite you to his birthday party. Will you come to his birthday party? And yes, Arafat at the time, he was locked up in his Mukata and he wasn't allowed out anywhere. So he couldn't come, but he took his kafir off his head and he wrote on it, 
to Jacob, happy birthday from Yasser Arafat. And sent him some gifts. Totally inappropriate gifts for a little boy. You know, just all these trinkets of Jesus and Bethlehem. So I did his funeral because his wife, who was Christian, no, it wasn't his wife, Yasser Arafat, um, before he returned from the hospital in Paris, he said, I'm only having one person do my funeral, and that's Abuna Andrew. And he had got quite cross with me at one stage because he was afraid that I would bring them and going to spend all my time in Iraq. And, but Yasser Arafat used to talk to my little son, Jacob. And I remember one day when um, Yasser Arafat phoned up and he said, can I speak to Jacob? I said, Jacob, present Arafat for you. And he said, tell him I'm busy. I'm watching The Simpsons. <laughs> oh, the kid. I, I just want to thank you so much for joining us and for the hour of your time in the middle of the night. I didn't realize when I asked you exactly where you were in the world. So um, yeah, we're just so thankful just to, that you were able to, to wake. I wouldn't have, I would have slept through it. <laughs> 2.30 in oh, the morning. <laughs> but, it's really great having been with you. Yeah. And I was reading a little about your work. It's very interesting, isn't it? So do you do work with people who are suffering as well? Um, that would be true. He's not here tonight. I was filling in for him. So he's going to watch the recording. And um, he's, yeah, he's regrettably, he really wanted to be here. But yeah, he's... Um, at the mustard seed and the same thing, many homeless and and hurting and and Kathy just joined us and um, Kathy is Hi, Kathy. Yeah. So Kathy's Hello. filled with the power and the glory of God as well surrounds her and yeah we're just she's also on the island in Vancouver. But, um, so are you a church group or are you from different churches? We're all from different churches, I think, pretty much. We're... For me, this is my church. Yeah. But I think a few of the others go to like physical congregations as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we're all different denominations, I think. But um, there's Pentecostal. Different flavors. Yes. Flavors. Yeah. Yes, but part all part of the body. So it's because good. because of COVID, we've all come together. And Drew is kind of the main guy that that's drawn us all together. Uh, Patsy had throat surgery, so we couldn't go to church safely. So this has just been such a blessing from God to to be able to join and yeah. Yeah, and this is technically during the work day for me. I'm on lunch break and I'll have to go back to work soon, but I've what been blessed with an... Mm, sorry? What's your work? I'm a software engineer and oh. I work for a company that writes programs for lots of different clients. Um, so I've helped build websites for healthcare products and social enterprises and private businesses who are trying to improve the way that their industries happen. So it feels like a real privilege to be working on products that are actually serving the yeah. community. And I'm in a workplace that appreciates that this is a really important part of my life. So I'm blessed with yeah. massive flexibility to take a long lunch break on a Friday mm -hmm. at erratic times, depending on what the Canadian and Australian time zones are doing. Break today. Yeah. I uh, I was very influenced by John Wimber. 
<laughs> don't know that he name. Was Canadian, wasn't he? I, I'm not British. sure. British. Toronto Vineyard. Uh, okay, yes, yes. So, Andrew, I'll extend an invitation. If ever you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep and it's, th it's Thursday our time or this time your time, you can use that link and pop in and your face will show up and you're welcome here anytime because what a blessing it's been to be in your presence. And my well, favorite been... part was your prayer because I felt Holy Spirit just magnified in that prayer. What an incredible, incredible blessing. Well, I can say it again. Yes, please do. I leave. That'll be the perfect prayer to, to leave. Thank you so, so much. I thank you, Lord, for this meeting. And in your presence, we say, Shimid Baba, Brona, Broka, Kosha, Ha Allaha, Allaho Ma'ana.